This week on Christian World News, it's the story of how the Old Testament was created and preserved. CBN Films' Oracles of God. Today, we'll travel through more than 2,000 years of history and unlock the keys to a biblical treasure hunt by unraveling the secrets of the Copper Scroll. And we'll see ancient ashes come to life and find new answers to the mystery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and talk with the documentary's creator. Welcome everyone to Christian World News. I'm Wendy Griffith. Well, the Bible is the most influential book in history, but how did it come to be? CBN Films' latest documentary, Oracles of God, the story of the Old Testament, explores how the Bible was created. We begin with the discovery of a 2,000-year-old treasure map, which describes more than $3 billion of hidden gold and silver. CBN's Chris Mitchell takes us to the place where the ancient treasure hunt began, the caves of Qumran. In 1947, a Bedouin shepherd wandered the hills of Qumran in search of a missing goat. He threw a stone into a cave, hoping to drive the lost animal outside. Instead, the sound of shattered pottery drew the shepherd inside the cave, where he stumbled on the greatest archeological find of the 20th century, the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the years that followed, archaeologists found 11 caves and more than 800 documents at Qumran. But one scroll was different than all the rest. Instead of parchment, it was made entirely of copper. And it could be the greatest treasure map in history. The copper scroll describes a cache of gold and silver vessels buried in more than 60 locations throughout Israel. The monetary value is close to $3 billion today, but the historical value is priceless. The only place in ancient Israel with that much wealth was the Jewish temple. It refers to the garments of the high priest. The amount of treasure that is buried is massive, and it's more than any one person could have. It's more than even a community could have. It just sounds like temple treasure. This is a tremendous witness to history to actually have a list of the treasures from the temple itself from the first century is just amazing. Well, we have nothing better than the Copper Scroll now for telling us what was really there. This is K3 at Qumran, where the scroll was hidden for nearly 2,000 years. What we have left that had the scrolls in it is right over here. But it was actually before the archaeologists got here, it was filled up to dirt right up to here where the, these markings are all along the cave. Mm -hmm. so, and so if you follow that marks are? right into here, you come in here, Chris, you actually can see the place where someone marked where the copper scroll originally was found right up against here. Even the scroll's language is mysterious. Most experts date the copper to between 25 and 75 AD, but the author wrote in a rabbinic style of Hebrew that doesn't match the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls and wasn't widely used in the first century. Adding to the puzzle is a series of random Greek letters. The copper scroll had to have been written just immediately before the destruction of the temple. So it actually fits the glove perfectly for the zealots who were the priestly group who were holding down the temple, keeping the temple from the Romans in the best way possible. But before they were massacred, they left things behind in caves here near Qumran. Copper was incredibly unusual as a writing surface. It's not beautifully done, it's done quickly. Why would you do this on beautiful copper? The only reason to write on copper is you're thinking of long preservation because copper can withstand fires. Some of the hiding places listed in the scroll are easy to find on a modern map, like Jericho, the Valley of Accor, and Mount Gerizim. Others are more cryptic, like Solomon's Canal, which contains a stash of silver coins, a well in Milham, where garments for the high priests were hidden, or Matias Courtyard, where more than 600 gold and silver temple vessels 
were buried. The instructions on the scrolls is like a, like a kid's treasure map in a way. They're talking about caves, they're talking about tombs, they're talking about aqueducts and pools and other things that were known to them at the time, probably with um, aliases of names applied to these places so that only those people who were part of the inner circle would know where to go, how many steps to go away, and where to dig and find the temple treasure that was buried in that spot. It assumes that whoever is finding the scroll will have some awareness of places that have long been forgotten. That's our problem. So what happened to the treasure? I think the treasure is somewhere out there. <laughs> somewhere. Um, maybe most of it has been found at different times by opportunists. But Fawn argues that anyone looking for it today is about 2,000 years too late. In my mind, most, if not all, of these were actually found by the Romans under the point of the sword. What we do know from the Ark of Titus in Rome, it shows a clear depiction of the main items of furniture and the trumpets that were used in the temple being carried in parade through the gates of Rome to the Forum. And we do know that Titus used the booty to build the Colosseum in Rome. If there's any treasure left, there would have been small parts that might not have been found that still lie out there ready for people to find today. We don't know. The scroll's last line hints at an even greater treasure, still undiscovered. What's interesting is that there were actually two treasure maps that were made. Here's line 64 of the scroll. In a dry well at Kulit, a copy of this document with its explanation and an inventory of each and every thing. The location of Colite is unknown, and today it's become a modern day El Dorado for archeologists and treasure hunters. The way I would read it, it's very much around Jericho, uh, not around Jerusalem, but around Jericho, perhaps as, um, as far as south as Qumran. The directions on the scroll may be a mystery, but the purpose of its writers is clear. They're writing for the future, hoping that people will still have some continuity. They will eventually be able to find this copper scroll and reconstitute life in Judea with the temple at its focus. It's a document of hope. Fascinating. Well, up next, bringing ashes back to life. We go behind the scenes of the fascinating discovery and restoration of the Engedi Scroll. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Christian World News. In 1965, the installation of a water pipeline led to the discovery of a 17-year-old synagogue in an Israeli nature reserve near the Dead Sea. Inside the ruins, Excavators found a tiny scroll that was buried beyond recognition. At least, that's what they thought. Chris Mitchell has the rest of our story. Near the shores of the Dead Sea is the desert oasis of En Gedi. In the Bible, it's the hiding place of David and a place of inspiration for Solomon. To the north is Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and to the south, the ruins of Herod's fortress at Masada. Today, En Gedi is a nature reserve, one of Israel's most beautiful national parks, and the site of an extraordinary archaeological discovery. The ancient settlement of En Gedi was destroyed by a fire in the 7th century. After the fire, the settlement was abandoned until 1970, when the ruins of the community synagogue were excavated. They found within the synagogue the holy place, the Bama, you know, the, with the Bible, and they found it all in ashes. And in the ashes, they found a hold of coins, they found a menorah, and they found a massive amount of ashes that already then they suspected were a scroll, but it was ashes. Forensics experts tried to decipher the rolled up scroll, which looked like a cigar. But in 1970, the technology was limited. So eventually the scroll was stored at the Israel Museum. 
Fast forward to 2015, when archaeologist Sefi Porat retrieved the burned scroll and took it to a team of conservators who work with the Dead Sea Scrolls. One day he walks in here with this, you know, it was still the top of one of the boxes with all these ashes and says, can you please image this? And I said, Sefi, you must be joking. This is ashes. He says, yes, but they said you have such a system. I said, yeah, it's not miracles, though. I mean, it's not as if uh, the ashes can come back to life. Eventually, it turned out that they could. Nobody, by the way, touches the scrolls. I don't touch them either. It's only these four or five conservators. And we did a CT scan, a tomography of all of these. And already then, it seemed as if that piece of charcoal was the most promising. The Israeli team sent 3D scans of the scroll to the University of Kentucky, where Professor Brent Seals used digital imaging to virtually unwrap the scroll and reveal part of the text. After 45 years, the puzzle was finally solved. He actually looked and saw that with these layers, he could decipher, he could pull out a layer that eventually turned out to be the first chapter of the Book of Leviticus. And you can see it, I mean, you can read it. I mean, how do we know? Because we can read it now. It was amazing. To me, everything is kind of symbolic. And I remember the day that we realized that this is, you know, the book of, of Leviticus, it was like, we looked at the computer and we said, unbelievable. And I wrote to Brian Seals, you won't believe what you've deciphered, what you've uncovered. The En Gedi scroll is the second oldest biblical scroll to be discovered and the oldest ever to be found inside a synagogue. This scroll was carbon dated, remember, to uh, the uh, third, fourth century. Why did this work? Because the ink that the Engedi scroll was written with probably has iron in it. We realized that the Engedi scroll is different because it has ink and therefore it is legible with this virtual 3D. It can identify the iron that is in this ink. Look how symbolic that the first chapter of the book of, of Leviticus talks about uh, the uh, sacrifices of the temple, okay? And here we are, and what happens to the sacrifices? They turn into ashes. And here we are bringing alive these ashes. And this was right before Tisha B'Av, which is the day of the destruction of the temple. So everything was very, very symbolic. We were really, uh, you know, in awe. It was like, you know, we're bringing back to life these ashes. Amazing. Well, coming up, it started with a chance meeting, a molecular biologist and a biblical scholar on a bus. It led to a fascinating discovery from the DNA of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Welcome back to Christian World News. Today, most scholars agree that the Dead Sea Scrolls were copied more than 2,000 years ago by a Jew Jewish group called the Essenes. The scrolls were hidden in the caves of Qumran near the Dead Sea and discovered in 1947. Now, new DNA tests on the scrolls suggest that not all of them came from Qumran. More than 70 years after their discovery, Fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls are still being counted, studied, and translated. A monumental task, considering that there are tens of thousands of fragments from nearly a thousand different documents. A handwriting analysis of the Dead Sea Scrolls reveals that they were copied by as many as 500 different scribes. There were thousands and thousands of scrolls placed in these caves. We only have a tiny, tiny fragment of the total number of scrolls that were originally put in the caves close to the site of Qumran. And that makes it hard to imagine that all of them came from a tiny little site in Qumran. That idea has now been confirmed by a series of DNA tests performed on some of the 2,000-year-old fragments. It all started in 2012, when a molecular biologist and a biblical scholar met on a bus. And each of us told the other what we're doing in terms of our research, and he thought it might be very cool to cooperate and to see what we can obtain. Professors Noham Mizrahi and Oded Ruhavi 
decided to test the DNA on some of the scroll fragments. But first they had to convince the organization in charge of the scrolls, the Israel Antiquities Authority. Before we could even sample the scrolls, we had to demonstrate that it's possible to get enough material. So the people at the Israel Antiquities Authorities, they just gave us in the beginning duct tape that was removed from different scrolls. And we analyzed the DNA from the duct tape. Now only later when we showed that this is even possible and we can get enough information without destroying these precious materials, we can move on to the more important uh, and real materials and samples. Once they got permission, they went to work using the smallest possible samples. They scraped just a little bit of scroll dust from the pieces, sometimes from just the, you know, the back side of each piece because you can't harm incredibly precious materials. The selection of the fragments was dictated by several factors. I was, of course, interested in fragments that can solve mysteries that scholars have been pondering about for many years now. We tried to sample both biblical and non-biblical texts, and among each of these groups, we tried to find the most interesting mysteries. Of course, our original intention was to sample much more than we actually sampled eventually, and the reason is that the Israel Antiquity Authority has the prerogative to vet our selection. Not every fragment that we wanted to sample could have been sampled. Some of the fragments are simply in such a terrible physical shape that even uh, touching them would cause their disintegration. Even with the small samples, the results were astonishing. Imagine we are only sequencing scroll dust 2,000 year old that was, the skin was processed to make the parchment. And later it was preserved in caves for 2,000 years. Still, despite all the contaminations of the different people that touched the scrolls, we were able to find enough animal DNA to say something about the scrolls, which is remarkable in my opinion. Those samples have suffered so much since antiquity that it is uh, just amazing, miraculous even, that uh, enough uh, genetic material survived in order for us to be able to uh, say something uh, about it and to contextualize it historically. Almost all of the samples tested were made of sheepskin, except two from the book of Jeremiah, which yielded some of the study's most intriguing results. We actually sampled fragments that represent four different copies of Jeremiah. This particular prophetic book has one of the most complicated textual histories among all the prophetic books of the Hebrew Bible. The four Jeremiah scrolls represent three different versions of the book. A longer version, based on the Masoretic text that's in most modern Bible translations today. A shorter version, based on the Greek Septuagint. And a third version of the book that was somewhere in the middle. Which means that the people there in Qumran held at the same time different versions of the book. And unlike today, where we have the exact same version, all of us, they were open to different versions and to different interpretations. But what surprised the team most was not the text, but what it was written on. Originally, these different pieces were thought to come from the same scroll. However, we were very much surprised to find that two of the scrolls pieces were written on sheepskin, while two were written on cow hide. Since cows need grass and water, they could not have survived in the desert near Qumran, which means that at least two of the copies of Jeremiah came from somewhere else. We can't say for sure that a particular scroll was written in Qumran, but we can say with a fair amount of confidence that some pieces, samples, came from outside of Qumran. And we learned that the texts that were common in Qumran were also popular outside of Qumran. It takes a lot of time, lots of effort to write uh, a scroll. And they suggested that perhaps, originally, the, the scrolls came from uh, the library of the temple in Jerusalem. And before the Roman conquest or the Jewish revolt, they were moved to be hiding here in, in the caves. So I think that uh, we solved some mysteries, we uncovered some new mysteries, and most importantly, we discovered that we still have much, much to learn and new mysteries to uncover. We have a few other mysteries that we would like to solve. We have a long wish list, 
and we will see how much of that uh, wish list we will manage to obtain in the years to come. And when we come back, we'll hear from the creator of the documentary, Oracles of God. Stay with us. Some question how the words of the Bible could be so carefully preserved over thousands of years. Oracles of God writer and director Aaron Zimmerman talked with CDM president and CEO Gordon Robertson, and she describes the care that modern day scribes take in copying manuscripts and where they get their focus. And so I said to this calligrapher and to the scribe, how do you not mess up? Because they couldn't have more than three mistakes on any scroll and you had to be able to fix those mistakes. And if you couldn't, you had to bury the scroll and start over. Mm -hmm. I said, how did you do it? And he said, for me, when I'm sitting here writing this and say I'm writing the letter Aleph, which is the Hebrew word for sort of an A, he said, that is the only thing on my mind. I'm not thinking about what I'm gonna do later. I'm not thinking about what I'm gonna eat, who I'm gonna see. I am thinking about an olive. And that is my purpose in life right now is to write that olive. And I believe he's taking that from history, from these same scribes for thousands of years had that kind of focus. And the name of God was very sacred to them. Now for us, we'll say it's sacred to us too, but you know, in an emergency, Sometimes we'll let fly, oh my, you know, whatever. These people took the name of God so seriously that when they were writing, they left spaces for his name, blank spaces. And then when it was, when it was time to write his name, the scribe would go out, wash in the mikvot, completely immerse himself in water, come back up, put on a new garment, get a new pen, and he would have to stand in front of his scroll and he would say, announce to the room, I'm now writing the name of God. And then he would have to say every character as he's writing it, Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. They couldn't say it, but they could spell it. And that is the um, great care and excellence with which they treated the name of God. So fascinating. Well, if you'd like to watch the documentary about the making of the Old Testament, you can find out how at cbn.com slash oracles of God. Well, until, until next week, from all of us here at Christian World News, thanks for joining us. Goodbye, and as always, God bless you.